named Rob Palenka. Uh, he's known as one of the uh, top player agents in the NBA. Uh, his, he is the agent for the likes of people like James Harden and uh, Eric Gordon and, and uh, Derek Williams and, and Dion Waiters, and along with other uh, of the top NBA talent. He, he perhaps, uh, his, his best known and, and his biggest cash cow as far as clients goes is probably uh, the late, great Kobe Bryant. Uh, his success as an agent actually propelled him uh, into a sort of a different career, but sort of related. He went from being a sports agent to being the general manager of the Los Angeles Lakers, and it's a position that he actually still holds today. And as an agent, his main concern was getting his clients the fattest check that they could possibly get. And however, when he was on the other side of the table now as a general manager, uh, he has to manage a high-caliber team with dealing with uh, this tight budget salary cap that uh, most sports have now, and he proved that he quickly had uh, a lot to learn. Because one year after he lured megastar LeBron James over to the, uh, the Lakers as a free agent, he engineered a, a trade for this disgruntled player named Anthony Davis from the New Orleans Pelicans. And uh, this guy had been rumored to come over to the Lakers for quite some time, and, and so they finally made it, uh, they, they made it be so, and sources uh, within the organization claimed that uh, they wanted to land Davis as well as a couple other uh, very highly paid superstars of the basketball world. Uh, however, Palenka uh, agreed to the deal in principle before realizing that he hadn't cleared enough salary cap in his, uh, on his team uh, in order to get this, this targeted third player that he wanted. And so after he had publicly announced that this man was going to come and play for the Los Angeles Lakers, he had to call the Pelicans back and beg them to restructure the deal. And so though he uh, claimed this great success as an agent... He found out that he did not know how to count the cost as a general manager of a team. He ignorantly assumed that everything would just go well for him. Now, Palenka is a stark image of how many of us tend to live our lives in Christ. We, we may very well have seen some sort of success in a lot of areas in life. Maybe our careers are going really well. Maybe we've been really successful uh, raising our children. Perhaps our marriage has been uh, stable throughout the years. Maybe our retirement accounts are looking pretty good uh, with where we are at, and, and uh, we're going to be taken care of for years. But however, when it comes to our walk with Christ, for one reason or another, we have settled for a cheapened version of Christianity. And the result are undisciplined disciples of Jesus, a weakened church, and an unreached world. Our passage today in Colossians, Paul brings to our attention the economics of faith. That when we come to Christ, indeed we do receive so much. We have freedom from sin. We have an absolved conscience. We have a, a place and a person to go to in, in the midst of the storms of life. Indeed, in Christ we have an entirely new life. But in exchange for all those benefits of being in Christ, we forget that there's a cost that comes with it. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood here. Our standing with God is not based on our work or anything that we pay in order to, uh, to buy God off, in order to, to be right with Him. There is nothing that you or I could ever do that would ever get us right with God. We are good with God solely on the merits of Christ Jesus alone and His work on the cross and in His life and in His resurrection. It's a free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Jesus, Romans tells us. 
But the argument that I want to make, and I believe that Paul is alluding to here in this passage, is that when we have received the grace of God in Jesus Christ, there is a cost to owning that. And that cost is threefold. There's a sacrifice, there is an investment, and there's also a mindset change that we need to make. So let's dig into this text and see what, uh, what Jesus wants us to know through the pen of the Apostle Paul today. This is what he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in chapter 1, verse 24. Paul writes, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all the energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all those who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, reaching all the riches, uh, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding in the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Let's pray together. Father, would you help us to see this text rightly? Would you help me to apply it well? Lord, would you help us to see the cost of discipleship, but also the vast riches that come with it? Prepare our hearts now, Lord, to receive this word. And it's in Jesus' name that I ask this. Amen. You know, many companies and organizations uh, run and operate their organizations on something called a mission statement. And what a mission statement is, it's, it's basically just a, a pithy little statement that, uh, one, that is one or two sentences that describes what a company and an organization is all about. It's about what their ethos is, what, what is the reason that they do what they do. It, it shows what their place in the world is. And a good company will not just leave that mission statement on the letterhead or, uh, or on, written on the wall somewhere, but rather they will let that mission statement be the driving force for everything that it, that it says and does and, and thinks. Further, a mission statement uh, typically helps them to stay focused on what they are meant to do and be able to say no to those, those good things, but those things that aren't necessarily helping the organization get to uh, where they want to be. You know, our, our, our church has a mission statement, and, and truth be told, we, we really don't use that mission statement in, in the way that we should and that's one reason why we're working through some strategic planning throughout, uh, throughout this year to figure out who we are and where we're going. But if mission statements were a thing way back in Paul's day, Paul probably would have had a personal mission statement that went something like this, to know Christ and to make him known. That would be a pretty good mission statement for any believer or really any church. It clearly points to a goal, to know Christ and to make him known. And with such a mission statement, the immediate question would be, how do you do that? How do you accomplish 
that mission. And in verse 24, Paul tells us one way in which he accomplishes those goals. Uh, look in verse 24. In the beginning, he says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. That's an awfully strange way to reach a goal, isn't it? To rejoice in suffering? But before we look at Paul as some sort of masochist who enjoys pain, we need to understand what, what Paul is talking about in this particular context. Paul is not saying that he takes pleasure in the pain, but rather the suffering he takes pleasure in because it's what, uh, what leads him to do and be who he's supposed to be. His suffering is an avenue by which the Colossians can know Christ and to make him known. Paul's sufferings are even for us today. Did you note that he says, and for all other people who have not seen me face to face? His suffering is for our joy. And he goes on in verse 24, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Again, some clarity is, is needed here. When I was a, a pastor in Nebraska, there was a, a lady who was in our church. She was, she was a sweet gal, but she came to me one day, and, and she wanted some help in something because she, she claimed that whenever she was having private prayer time, she would get a sensation that she was being choked. And I thought, well, that was awfully strange. And she asked me what I thought of that. And I said, well, obviously that's not of God because God wants a, a peaceful relationship, a, a peaceful being with, with both of us. So if, if you're being choked whenever you're praying, then obviously something spiritual is going on that is not good. She said, well, you know, I'll think about that and I'll come back. And, and um, then the next week I talked with her after church and I said, you know, I, I've been praying about this. I've been thinking about this and I really don't think it's a good thing that you are being choked every single time you pray. And, you know, as we're talking, she starts choking right there in the sanctuary, falls on the pew, and holds her throat because she cannot breathe. And so I, I pray, and she kind of comes out of it, and I, well, that was weird, um, you know, and I said, we need to talk about this. Let's, you know, meet soon. And the next week, she came to my office and said, Pastor, I've been praying about this, and I'm okay with this. Because in, in what I understand this to be is when I am choked when I pray, that is me filling up what is lacking in Christ's sufferings. And so I said, well, I, I really don't think you're understanding that passage quite as Paul is intending it to be. And I want to warn you that you may be having some sort of spiritual battle going on that might need a little more work. She said, well, no, Pastor, I'm, I think this is totally of God, and I'm going to let it happen. It was the last time I saw her. It's a bizarre story. I don't typically like recounting that, but it's a radical, understand, it's a radical illustration of how we often can misunderstand what Paul is saying. Because from this dear lady's perspective, she believed that Christ's sufferings in life and on the cross were not sufficient, that they were not complete. Therefore, for whatever reason, she believed that she had been appointed, like Paul, to suffer in the stead of not only other people, but according to this verse, that she was suffering in the stead of Christ. That is not what Paul is getting at here. When Paul is saying, in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, what Paul is alluding to here is what is true of anyone that bears the redemptive mark of Jesus in their life. If you belong to Christ, you will suffer. If you are a member of the body of Christ, you will share in his sufferings. 
This is what, what Jesus said himself in Matthew chapter 5 when he said, blessed are you when others revile you. Notice he didn't say if others revile you. He says when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. He goes on in, in John chapter 15. Jesus says, if the world hates you, Know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of this world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of this world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept, if they kept my word so they would also keep yours. But all these things will, they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said to me, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Acts 14, 22, Paul pled with uh, with the people saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Our lot in life as Christians, part of it is to suffer. And what Paul is saying then that if we are Christ's body on earth, if we are his hands and feet, then we will share in his sufferings. We are not to complete his sufferings as if his work on the cross is insufficient but rather we are to become like him in every way, whether it's by character or whether it's in suffering. For some, like Paul, it means imprisonment, it means beatings, it might mean being executed. This is the case for many of our brothers and sisters right now in the Middle East and in certain places in, in Asia where they are meeting in secret this morning because if the government or if radicals find out what they were doing, they could be killed. We're not at that place right now here in America, and that's neither good nor bad. It's just different. We have different sets of pressures. For you, you may face ridicule. You may face rejection. And you may face problems from family, friends, coworkers, people that you deeply care about because of your love for Jesus. Most certainly, if you are in Christ, you will feel a bit of anguish for those people that you love, that you know aren't walking with Christ, but you deeply desire them to know Him and to walk with Him. And you pray and you pray and you have conversations that just go nowhere. Or maybe you just, you, you don't even know what to say. Some of you have had to bury lost relatives. Or you're afraid that you're going to have to. But if that suffering, that pain that hurt that we experience in order to get them to know Christ and to make them known, if it pays off and they end up seeing the king in all of his beauty, you will one day say, every bit of that pain was worth it. To see them know Jesus. You will be able to join Paul in verse 24 when he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake to make the word of God fully known. And so we must be willing and ready to sacrifice things for the kingdom of God. But second, we also need to invest in, in eternity. Invest in eternity. You know, Paul was an investor. Uh, he, wasn't a, uh, he wasn't a capital investor in order to, to get in on the latest trendy project, a, a product that, that goes on Shark Tank. He, he was rather investing on something that is far longer lasting, has more of an impact, and he invested in something that actually mattered. 
Paul invested in eternity. Skip down with me all the way down to verse 29. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. That's his investment. His work, his toil, his struggle. The word toil here means not just to work, but it also literally means to grow tired, to grow weary. And many of you have had days like that where you've worked a long shift and you're just exhausted at the end. Well, that's where Paul is at. Ministry is hard work. It's emotionally draining, which can often take more toll on a body than some other professions can do. And the word for struggling here is the word agonizomai in Greek, which is, where do you think, what word do you think we get from that? It's agony. This is to strive, to fight. And what labor is it that he engages in? Look in verse 28. That we may present everyone mature in Christ. And Paul phrases this very an interesting way because it can be very tempting for you and I who have been Christians for a while uh, to uh, maybe one day after a certain amount of education, maybe after a certain amount of experiences, to one day look at our lives of where we've been and where we've come and we can, wow, I'm finally mature. I finally made it. I'm finally humble. It took a while. But I'm finally there. That might work in the world. You can see evidence of children maturing, and you can see evidence in, in, in some adults that need to grow up that do. But in the economy of faith, it doesn't work like that. It isn't something that you can obtain in some sort of measurable way. It's not something that we'll be able to see in this life. When Paul talks about maturity here, he is making the case of saying that you and I will never be mature in this life. Fully mature, that is. We will never realize the perfection that is ours in Christ until the day that we are with him in glory. So Paul then doesn't have a short-term view of his ministry. But he is in this for the long haul. He realizes that just getting someone to make a decision in Christ isn't enough. They have a long way to go. That he has a long way to go. And we can follow suit in him in that, that when we look at our friends and our neighbors and our family members that we desperately want to, to come to know Christ, we ought not to see them as a project that if they come to Christ, then all right, project's finished, move on to the next one. It's an investment into their lives and into their eternity. Seeing our family and friends come to Christ is glorious, but it isn't the end. You know, one of the most difficult aspects of being uh, in pastoral ministry is rarely seeing a finished product. We work and we work and, and we, we, we pray, and, and, and for years and years we may never see the fruit of our labor. We might one day. But it's hard when you never see a completion. So how does Paul go about this striving? How does he keep moving forward? Well, he says in verse 28, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. So what is the warning here? The warning is, is that our sin has separated us from our Creator. That because we have been born with this nature and this propensity to shake our fist at God and tell Him that we know better than Him. The proclamation that what God required of us, which is punishment for our sin, God also took care of by sending Christ Jesus on our behalf. 
and taking the punishment that we deserved upon the cross. Through his death and through his resurrection, we are made new with God, not based on our merits, but based on his merits. The teaching Paul talks about here, the only hope we have is Christ. We cannot just simply add him to our religious framework and have it be okay. Jesus demands total commitment and total obedience of our lives. And the wisdom that comes from this only comes from the Holy Spirit. And, and Paul's mission and his striving is exactly what you and I ought to be striving for as well. That the fullness of God's power, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, would work through us in such a way that Paul alludes to in the end of verse 29. So if we have come to Christ... We should continually die to ourselves. We'll see more in detail next week, but much too often it seems as if many of us who are in Christ, we come to him not to die to ourselves, but rather to live, uh, but rather to join a club in which we receive spiritual dividends to fill our desires, to fill our preferences. And Paul tells us that Christianity is an investment in eternity for others. We don't live for ourselves anymore. All of our energy is to live for others and have them know Jesus and make him known. So what kind of a financial Christian are you? Are you one that just wants to, to take all the dividends and all the, the bonuses and, and all the rewards that come with it? Or are you an investor that one day will reap rewards that you don't even have a clue about right now. We need to invest in eternity. But the third thing we need to do is that we need to go on guard. You know, we all love the idea of guardians and, and protectors in entertainment, our adrenaline flows when we see a good keeper of the gate who, who never backs down when, when a threat comes and they'll fight to the death in order to protect that which they have sworn an oath in order to, uh, to protect and to guard. There's one character in Norse mythology who is highlighted in the Thor movies that I just absolutely love. His name is Heimdall, and he is the protector of Asgard. And not only does he talk really cool with a really cool voice, but he's also got this really cool weapon. And he just stands there at the gate of Asgard and an army can come up to him and all he needs to do is just one fell swoop and he can knock them all out of there. It's just so cool to see a guardian like that. I think of someone like Gandalf. Man, I'm really making myself out to a geek today. I think of Gandalf in, in the Fellowship of the Rings when the Fellowship is running up out of, out of the, the mountain and Gandalf stands on the bridge and this big demon thing comes up to him and, and Gandalf takes his staff. You shall not pass! And he slams it down and He's guarding those people and like, yes, that's the kind of guy that I want to be like. I want to be a protector like that. And you want that too. I mean, guys, this is why if there's a bump in the night or a break in the window, that we can wake up from a deep sleep to get ready to fight off anything that comes into our house because this is what is natural for us. It's why security measures exist on your computers. Why we have metal detectors and bag searches at airports and, and sporting events. We're hardwired to protect that which is important to us. But I wonder how, much have, how many of us have ever considered being on guard theologically. We lock our doors when we leave the house or when we go to bed at night. Some of you may even conceal and carry, but yet in the church, 
We have no idea how easy it is to let destructive beliefs in through the back door. Paul sums up his argument in verse 4 of chapter 2 when he says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Now, we'll get into more of those plausible arguments here next week and the weeks that follow. But for now, understand what Paul is saying here. It is possible for followers of Christ to fall into false doctrine. In fact, it's easier than many of us think. How so? Well, Paul says it's because they are plausible arguments. What is something that is plausible? Something that is plausible is something that seems reasonable. Or it seems like it might be uh, possible. It is an argument that has enough truth in it to sound right, but enough of a lie that can lead us astray. It's laced with enough poison to kill those who consume it. So the anecdote, Paul writes, is in verse 2, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So how is it that you can guard yourself against false doctrine, or may I even say heresy? It is to know Christ. It is to know him more, know his word, know him experientially, to know him in such a way that any counterfeit that comes across your eyes, you can immediately see this is wrong and I'm going to reject it. It is when we know Christ that Paul can say in chapter 2, verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. For the Colossians, they were torn on one side because on, on one side they had, uh, they had uh, the Jewish folks that would tell them, you have to have Jesus plus be a Jew. And they had on the other side uh, someone, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Greek mindset pulling them from a different angle saying, no, if you want to be a Christian, you have to have Christ plus Greek philosophy. And maybe even some of the Greek gods that are put in there as well. And we may be pulled in many different directions in our culture as well. On one side, our culture says, totally cool. You want Jesus? That's great. But if you want Jesus, you have to add him to the current cultural uh, views. You have to add him to sensuality. You have to add him to tolerance. And whatever political leaning you might have, whether it's to the right or it's to the left. And every other valid belief that may be out there. On the other hand, the world has crept into, into the church in such a way that we see a faith as Jesus plus whatever self-help guru that is on the top of Oprah's book club for the month. Or we see Jesus plus Jesus Calling. Or we see Jesus plus Jen Hatmaker. Or Jesus plus Rachel Hollis. We don't need these types. And we don't see them as destructive to our faith. We have let our guard down. And some of us have been duped by well-sounding arguments. Instead of drinking from the wellspring of life and Jesus alone, in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, as two, three tell us. We're rather drinking from a broken cistern that is running out with whatever we pour into it. We need more guardians. We need more people that are willing to know Christ and to make him known. We need people that are willing in love to call out the dangers that some of the false beliefs and philosophies that come into uh, the church, out of your love for 
out of love and faith for your brothers and sisters in Christ, will you commit to knowing Christ and making him known as the way that he has presented himself through his word? Are you willing to lay down your life and help put a fence around those precious doctrines that we can't back down on? Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't think we need to go on a heresy hunt and stand behind every tree and, and, and search everything to see, well, is this right or is this wrong? That we can give people the benefit of the doubt, but we need to be like the Bereans who search the scriptures to see if these things were true. And that doesn't mean that... Uh, that there, isn't no, that there aren't negotiable doctrines that we can have freedom in, in Christ. But it does mean that we have to be ready and attentive and discerning. Everyone loves a good guardian. And if you're in Christ, you've been called to what Paul called Timothy to in 1 Timothy chapter 6 when he said, um, guard the deposit entrusted to you Avoid irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. So if there's anything that I could encourage you with on this point, it is to pick up the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Take your position and then take your stand sacrifice, invest, and guard. That is your calling. And that is my calling as well. The question is, is this just going to be one of those messages where you leave the sanctuary and go about to your Super Bowl party or whatever this afternoon and, and say, well, that was an interesting message and nothing in your life changes? Or are these things that you are going to strive for with the power that God gives you and works in you? You know, verse 27 tells us that the glory of this mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. With that being said, sacrifice, invest, and guard. Let's pray. Heavenly Father,